Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for us. Maybe that'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And, as always, you can promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. And there's a Virtual Memories Show special announcement. This weekend, April 7th and 8th, 2018, is the Mocha Arts Festival in Manhattan. As part of the festivities, I'll be recording a live episode of the show with the great cartoonist Roz Chast on Saturday, April 7th at 2 p.m. So if you're going to be in New York this weekend, check out the festival. Lots of cartoonists, lots of great art. It's a really nice venue on the west side right by the Intrepid. You can find out more. Go to societyillustrators.org which is the website for the Society of Illustrators, which runs MOCA. And just hit the MOCA Arts Festival link, and you'll learn all sorts of stuff about the event and the programming, as well as how to get there. Um, well, the whole shebang, you know what I mean. And a lot of my past and future guests will be on hand. MOCA's always a fun show, and they have great art on display, and lots of good cartoonists um, selling books, showing off art, and, and in conversation like the one I'm going to have with Roz. So I hope to see you there. I had a kind of crazy week. There's no need to go into too much of it now, except to say that I once again got stuck in the Ottawa airport on a weather delay. Uh, I'm now two for two on that. However, I'm only one for two in bumping into Graydon Carter at the Ottawa airport. Didn't happen this time. Didn't bump into David Remnick or Anna Wintour either. Um, eh, you take what you can get. I did get hit with a head cold on that trip. Um, but I also recorded two podcasts this weekend, and basically my voice is kind of shot. You're going to hear a break a few times in this intro. Sorry. Anyway, let's dive into this week's conversation. My guest is the writer Jonathan Ames. Um, Jonathan has written a bunch of collections of essays, several novels, short fiction, and on top of that, he's the creator of two of my favorite TV shows, Bored to Death and Blunt Talk. On top of that, uh, there is a movie coming out this week adapted from his novella, You Were Never Really Here. Uh, it's directed by Lynn Ramsey and stars Joaquin Phoenix. And as part of the prep for this episode, I got to go to a screening of it in New York last week, and it's really, really good. Um, I tend to think of Jonathan's work as being light or comedic, you know, given the... Um, the outrageous kind of confessional essays that he, he once wrote and the nature of blunt talk and bored to death and, and other works of his. Um, but you were never really here is a dark crime novel novella. Um, Jonathan will talk about its roots in our conversation, but the director, the director does some interesting stuff adapting this into a movie. Uh, she could have made some easy storytelling choices, uh, in terms of of using voiceover or extended flashback or or other things that would have kind of given the audience a degree of security about the sort of story they were in, but to her credit, she doesn't take any of the easy outs. Uh, she made this a tough, intense experience. 
uh, the, the, the story, the lead character's background, it, it comes to you in fragments and she trusts us to put it together. It's, um, it's brutal in parts. Uh, it's got a harsh score and soundtrack, but it's beautiful to watch. Really amazing performances. Very, very good movie. And I'm, I'm really thankful I got to see it before sitting down with Jonathan because, as prep for that, I read the novella before going to see the movie, and they're they're very different experiences in a lot of ways. And we'll get into that in the conversation. Anyway, it'll be out this week in limited release and go wider in the weeks to come. So go see You Were Never Really Here. I'm telling you, really good movie. Now, Jonathan's doing publicity for the movie and the expanded reissue of the novella, which you can get from Vintage. Um, but actually, it's kind of coincidental. I just thought of trying to reach out to him through a mutual pal of ours and and the mutual pal actually reached out to me the day after i thought of reaching out to him uh anyway what's even more coincidental once i started to set this up with jonathan uh we discovered that we grew up basically one town apart here in northern new jersey and um when he learned that i'd live in ringwood he offered to come out to my house to record rather than do it in new york where he's staying and um and there's something really interesting about that, um, because Jonathan knows this this area. He he knows the one road in and out of my town. He spent a lot of time up on the mountain, as we call it, uh, hiking and such. And and he had this really great moment when he walked in the door of my house because the floor plan for almost all of the houses from our era are pretty similar. Uh, they're they're all this nine room, either bi level or split level. They have a couple little variations, but. They're pretty much the same builder and the same plan they all came with. I know it's weird that I've stayed in the same house almost my entire life, but but it was cool to meet someone who has has left, has built a career, has has gone into the arts, etc., but who has that exact same DNA, who's got the the same layouts and landscapes just imprinted in his brain. Um, he's got the same view from Skyline Drive, you know, looking over at, at New York City, which we'll we'll talk about, but. But even just the the interior thing, what the what the the houses here do to you, what it's like being out in the suburbs, it's interesting to me to see someone um, who had that and was able to build a a real career in writing because I can no longer use that as an excuse for why I'm an abject failure. Anyway, um, after we wrapped off, Mike, we also spent a bit more time reminiscing about growing up here, um, including the, the the video arcades and the the movie theaters and. And the roller disco that's that's long gone. I, and I think he kind of dug having that opportunity to share with somebody. I'm prattling on at length. Jonathan's fiction, essays, and journalism are a blast. And like I said, I loved his two, v, uh, his two TV shows. I rewatched some of both series before we got together. And the absence of blunt talk, which got canceled after two seasons, pains me to no end. It was such a good show. I'm so disappointed it didn't get uh, get picked up. So that's me and my soapbox. Here's Jonathan's bio. Jonathan Ames is the author of the novels I Pass Like Night, The Extra Man, Wake Up, Sir, and the graphic novel The Alcoholic, illustrated by Dean Haspiel, as well as the novella You Were Never Really Here, and the essay collections What's Not to Love, My Less Than Secret Life, I Love You More Than You Know, and The Double Life is Twice as Good. He is the editor of Sexual Metamorphosis, an anthology of transsexual memoirs, and has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. He is also the creator of two television shows, the HBO series Bored to Death and the Star series Blunt Talk. His novel The Extra Man was made into a film starring Kevin Kline, and You Are Never Really Here has been adapted for the screen starring Joaquin Phoenix. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Jonathan Ames. So you're the first guest for whom I can say, so your new movie is coming out this week. And I, I have had Oscar winners on the, the show previously and Jules mm -hmm. Pfeiffer um, mm -hmm. and a nominee and Bruce J. Friedman. But, mm -hmm. but you're the first one who actually has a movie, which is not the thrust of what I, I do for this. But mm -hmm. what was it like seeing this novella adapted into the movie that it became? Because it, it does ver veer from the, the story itself. Uh, well, I saw the movie for the first time under rather extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. It was at the Cannes Film Festival um, about 10 months ago. And so the whole thing was so wildly heightened. 
Um, I mean, I was in a tuxedo. We had been at some party, driven there in a limousine, then, you know, a cavalcade of limousines to this huge, I guess it's a movie theater. It's hard to describe. Um, but there was about three quarters of a football field length of passageway with stadium seating to either side. I think it was outdoors with just journalists or photojournalists with cameras. And it was the most, it was the longest red carpet imaginable. Now I, I didn't walk the red carpet uh, per se, but though as part of the team that walked through and there was just, you know, probably 2000 camera people. So it, it it also felt absurd, you, you know. <laughs> I would hope the world is the polar ice caps are melting. You know, there's so much trouble on the planet, and here all these forces were gathered around film at the Cannes Film Festival. So I saw the movie for the first time, and it's a very strong piece of cinema. You know, uh, the director, you feel her intention. I think in every frame and every editing choice and every bit of sound. Um, and it, and Joaquin Phoenix is just a, a brooding, intense, at times playful, scary presence in the film. Um, now the ending does uh, derivate from my novel. I had also sent Lynn Ramsey, the director, uh, the beginning of my sequel to the book, I always intended to continue, and I am writing the sequel now. She used a little bit of the sequel to inform her ending somewhat. Um, so I was a little thrown by the changed ending um, and being so close to it. Um, you know, I I was somewhat taken aback, not in a bad way, but I and I didn't know if it made quite as much sense as as I had written it, but things are much more explicit in books and it's very yeah. clear. Um, but overall, and then then the film got like a seven minute standing ovation at, <laughs> at Cannes. And I have a thing, I'm not a big Twitter person, I'm a bit pathetic at it, but on my Twitter, there's like someone had found a video of me standing there clapping standing behind Joaquin Phoenix and Lynn for seven minutes, um, uh, looking, as I put it on my Twitter, like Zelig. Um, and I was wearing the cap I always wear because of, I guess, insecurity about balding and all that. And, and also, as a bald man, uh, you need a hat for sun exposure and for um, chilly drafts. It's amazing how much hair does provide warmth. So anyway, it was it was a great first time to see the movie. Then I saw it again at the London Film Festival, and uh, it had been further edited, and the crowd loved it, and I really enjoyed it. And then I saw it again at the Sundance Film Festival, and uh, I, I just the whole time. And, yeah. I, I just get a kick out of it. I yeah. you know um, I see different things that she did, little shots, and um, and so you know with this book. I wrote it very quickly, and then I expanded it. We can maybe get into the history of this odd book. But um, I wasn't deeply emotionally attached. And I said to her and to Joaquin when I met them, I had corresponded with Lynn about the film for about two years. She would send me drafts of the script. I'd give her notes. And then I met with everybody you know, we, uh, to talk about the movie about a week before they started shooting. And I... I expressed and i hope it came through like this is your thing go make your art you know how to make it work as a film for you so i was not you know emotionally attached like oh my god you know as if if they did something different that yeah. they were how derivating from, yeah from a yeah. sacred text i mm -hmm. intended this as an entertainment and i think she did a great job yeah, it does feel not of a piece, the the book itself, with you know your other writing that I've... Mm. I, I mean, there is the crime fiction element of it, mm. but mm. like the playfulness of, of mm. Joe in the movie is not mm. really there in right. the, the book itself. Right. It's much more this brooding interior thing. Right. I guess, what was the genesis of the, the book itself for you? Was it an yeah. attempt at just kind of getting away from your your 
I don't want to say usual fare because you mm. do vary pretty wildly mm. in what you, the stories that you tell. But. Yeah, well, primarily my career, um, my first novel came out in 1989. It was called I Pass Like Night. And that had some comedy, but was mostly a dark, yeah. you know, coming of age novel. And after I wrote that book, my mother said to me, why don't you write something funny? You're so funny. And I, it's not like I'm such a mama's boy, but almost like no. the rest of my career from that moment, though I did have a one man show called Oedipussy back in 1999. So maybe I am a mama's boy. But anyway, that after that, basically everything I did for the, you know, from my second novel on, uh, and it took me nine years to publish a second novel, which came out in 98, The Extra Man, was, you know, based in comedy. Every now and then I might write a more somber essay. I, I wrote tons of nonfiction. But I was always trying to amuse. And then, um, and then after all my prose writing, I got into TV, as, as you know. And again, that was very comedy-based. And that kind of took me over to writing for television for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And right as the TV stuff, or there was a pause in the TV stuff, I was approached by a friend of mine, Amy Grace Lloyd, to write a long-form fiction piece for a, a, an internet concern called Byliner. And I think there was like a 15,000-word uh, limit. <clears throat> and I'd been reading only pulp fiction for several years. I was obsessed with the writer Richard Stark, <clears throat> pseudonym for Donald Westlake. Yeah. And I'm still obsessed with Stark, and he has 24 novels about a character named Parker, and I've read those over repeatedly, you know, um, and I, I've described this elsewhere. It's like sort of like an, an eccentric person who'll only eat tuna fish. For a long time, I'd only eat Stark. I would take other things, <laughs> and, oh, and there wasn't there a Stark tuna? Anyway, but anyway, our Starkist, but... Um, I would read other things, but it was just like this stark diet. I was obsessed with his prose, his storytelling, how he created this character. And I was obsessed with page turners. So I originally wrote this in 2012 for Byliner, and I wanted to write a page turner in entertainment, something that was not comedic, in the third person, because I'd primarily written in the first person. And and it was and so it was like an, an experiment, and to write the kind of thing that I enjoy reading. I'd always told my students when I was a teacher, write the kind of books that you love. And so then it came out with Byliner in 2013, you know, a few months after I wrote it. Then it came out in France as a little kind of Roman policier, like a little crime novel and England. But because it came out in France, a French film producer spotted it, it was getting great reviews in France as a proper book, not an e-book. And not that e-books aren't proper, but I'm talking about but, a yeah. physical book you can hold. And that French film producer got it to Lynn Ramsey. And by 2014, Lynn and I were corresponding and sort of working on the film. Now it's coming out in the States or is, is out in the States as a book. And this summer, because I knew it was going to come out as a book, I expanded it by about 20 pages from the original version. So the version that's out now from Vintage, vintage Crime, Black Lizard... Um, is about 20, 25 pages longer than the original one that I wrote several years ago. So that's kind of the odd genesis of it. It was wanting to write the sort of thing I'd come to love reading, a page turner in entertainment. And like I said, I'm working on the sequel in that same style. Yeah, what did you, it sounds banal, but what did you learn about that type of writing in the process of writing it? Um, what did I Were there parameters and things that you said, wow, I, I can't do... X, Y, and Z in this, I have to narrow or focus or... I'm trying to think. I mean, what I learned is that I enjoy it. Um, I, For me, all writing, scripts, essays, novels, it comes down to enjoying writing a sentence. Now, I'm not necessarily the best sentence maker in the world, but I, I, I try to make sentences that have clarity, that... Um, that the reader will enjoy absorbing and and that and in this case sentences that just sort of compel you to go along so i like the idea of trying to write with pace hmm. um and what i and this kind of writing what's interesting of course it's very plot oriented you know and you the characters always got to be moving forward and, and and this drags the reader along and so to try to write sentences that 
make the reader keep going and not want to put it down. That was my goal because there's a certain pleasure. A lot of people tell me they read the book in one sitting that they couldn't stop. Yeah, I read like 10 pages at night the night before and then the next morning I just got up and read the rest of it downstairs. Yeah, and there's a certain pleasure in that, like when you can't stop or you got to put it down. Um, Now, of course, there's the pleasure of like a longer book that you have by your bed that you read 10 pages a night or 15 or five and you just dance to the music of time. Yeah. And you just sort of take your time with it and you're in a whole world. But this is, this was like writing an action piece. And, uh, yeah, so I'm not exactly sure what I learned, but it also, you, what you, what can be a challenge is there can be boring moments because you've got to like describe things or you know set it up and and so how to do that interestingly now one of the things that i sort of took from screenplay writing because when you have to do um describe the actions in a screenplay i always tried to write that very efficiently i kind of thought of it as crime blotter writing or Mm -hmm. crime report writing you know just be as direct and as quick but as compelling as possible yeah Mm -hmm. Of the various mediums you've written for, I mean, we've got novels, short fiction, columns, essays, reportage, mm-hmm. film, mm-hmm. TV, et cetera. Preference? Besides the money, um, you know, preference for a particular form? Um, I think the novel, writing fiction, is the most fun. Um, you know, nonfiction, you're worried about, in my case, since I would tend to write autobiographically or, you know, use myself as a character, questions of, oh, what do I want to expose or am I going too far or, you, you know. Um, well, I've got a whole bunch of questions about that. So. <laughs> yeah. So so that can be limiting. Um, writing for television, there's all sorts of people you have to please and be worried about. Um I haven't written, I've written several movies, um, only one of which got made, which was the one based on my novel, The Extra Man. And in that case, the directors also worked on the script. But film and television are so collaborative, so many people you have to please. It can take some of the joy out of writing. Mm-hmm. Not the actual writing itself, but the whole process can become upsetting. <laughs> um, so, was there, something, was there something you couldn't get away with? On TV? Well, or one thing in particular that you really wanted to get into either of the shows? Oh, I'm sure there were many things I would have to cut, whether an actor didn't feel comfortable or the network said no, or but also just the constraints of the form itself. You can't necessarily have someone go on a long monologue or you can't convey what's in a person's mind the way you can in a novel. In a novel, you can do everything. And the reader is there collaborating with you. Uh, you know, you're, you're making that art together and they can take what they're reading and, you, you know, inform it, inform themselves, but you're giving them all the information. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, novel writing is ultimately the most pleasurable. It's the most free. Have you been working on a... Yeah, well, I'm working on the sequel to this. Yeah, but, yeah, but you but, know, uh, another, is there a, a magnum opus Jonathan Ames novel that's... that's? Oh, no, I only work okay. on one thing at a time. Yeah. Um, so right now I'm just been focused on writing the, the sequel to You Were Never Really Here. And I see the Joe character. I, I wanted to create my kind of Parker, like Stark Richard Stark slash Donald Westlake had Parker, a character he returned to for 24 novels. He had also some other recurring characters, but Parker is the one I got into. Um, And, you know, but like Lee Child with Jack Reacher or Raymond Chandler with Philip Marlowe or Dashiell Hammett with The Continental Op. I wanted to create a character I could return to. So I do have an idea for like a third Joe novel or where Joe will end up. And and, and then by the third book, <clears throat> that might be his base from which I could write multiple stories if I keep going with him and he'll keep evolving. So he'll be, be, he won't, you know, he'll be an interesting character to keep uh, following. But I also, after I finish this sequel, I think I would like to try to find a way into writing a comedic novel again. Cause I recently wrote a, I read a comedic novel by a first time author, a really great book called Sommelier of Deformity. <laughs> And I so enjoyed it that I'm like, oh, my God, the pleasures of a comic novel, because all I've been reading for a decade or more 
has have been page turners in thrillers um and with some other things you know that uh you know wash up on the shore by my bed where all my books are piled up that I'm reading but um, which, I'll, which I'll ask you about when we finish up but that's uh, that's always the who are you reading question that I love you know yeah um, get to that later. At, at the moment I'm uh, I'm in a little bit of a gap you know sometimes there's a gap where you don't yeah. you don't have a book that you're reading uh, not exactly. I always have something around, but something that I, I can't wait to get back to. For me, and I think I've said this before elsewhere, like books are my friends. You know, they're they're I I need them like food. And so when if I don't have a book, I'm looking forward to every night. It's it can be a little bit. There's an emptiness, like a cavity mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, I've, I've wondered if I didn't have this, which I've been focusing on for the last four or five years, what I would be reading if mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. carefully structuring to make sure I'm reading mm -hmm. things by mm -hmm. the various mm -hmm. guests coming mm -hmm. up, et cetera. Um, I keep a list of every book I've finished since mm -hmm. 1989. Whoa. It's on my site, which is embarrassing when you look back cool. at the ones from 1989, wow. but you know, it's, it's still, Gosh. you know, realizing who you were and what sort of things, especially mm -hmm. the books you come back to repeatedly, mm -hmm. which I guess I should ask besides reading Parker novels repeatedly, what sort of books recur in your life? What do you return to? Um, it seems like every five years or so, I return to Raymond Chandler. Mm -hmm. um, I either reread all or most of the oeuvre. Uh, sometimes new things are found. Um, so I've returned to him a number of times in my life. Um, I also return to Dashiell Hammett. Um, I've reread him a fair amount, not as much as um, Chandler. Uh, at one time, I would return a lot to P.G. Woodhouse, which was a big inspiration for me. And I'm thinking of going back to him again just to sort of dip in once more to writing something playful and whimsical and that conveys the silliness of life more than the bleakness of life, which is the, the territory I'm in at the moment with the sequel I'm writing. Um, I, I want to revisit Carson McCullers. Her name came up and I used to love her books so much. I remember years ago I would reread them. So I, I want to kind of go back and see if she still speaks to me. Um, the heart is a lonely hunter and I think I had some. I think I had some of her short stories. Um, I think these are some of the people. Kurt Vonnegut. I I return to in different ways at times. Um, those are just some of them off the top of my head. Where did writing start for you? Uh, well, not far from where we're sitting. <laughs> we are in Ringwood, New Jersey, and I grew up about three miles away or four miles away in Oakland, New Jersey. And um, my mother was a teacher. And the one thing that I was allowed to have more than anything else was books. So like every month in my school in Oakland, New Jersey, uh, Manitou, uh, it was called Manitou Public School or something. Um, all the schools where I lived were named after Native American tribes, just as a lot of the streets were, in fact. And I went to a high school called Indian Hills High School because in the mountains we're in right around here are called the Ramapo Mountains, which was a, a Native American tribe, the Ramapos. So anyway, I... You and could, the Ramapo Fault Line we also have over here for mm -hmm. the occasional earthquake. You probably didn't encounter too many of those when you were over here. No, but I, that rings a bell. And when I was a kid, when we used to come up this to this mountain where we are now, uh, up the road called Skyline Drive, you know, and you could see New York from the peak at some play, at some point, I think, and also from 208 at a peak, you could see New York in the distance, like mm -hmm. Emerald City, which is how I think I described it in my novel, The Extra Man. Uh, someone up here that we used to visit had said, like saw a UFO or UFOs in the early 70s. And so it was always <laughs> mysterious to come up this mountain as if maybe yeah. we'd see a UFO because we're so high up. This seemed like this big mountain. Um, but yeah, every month, the, I guess maybe with Scholastic Books, you could order books. Oh, yeah. And yeah. 
I, I, I only had used bicycles, not that this was a difficult childhood, but I was never allowed to have like new things, you know, at least in terms of sporting equipment. And we weren't, my sister and I couldn't really buy albums, but the one thing that there was an unlimited budget on was books. So every month I would get like comic books and sports biographies. And it was like Hanukkah or Christmas every month with scholastic books. And then my sophomore year in high school at Indian Hills High School, my English teacher, Ann Peters, took an interest in me. And I was on the soccer team and had a sprained ankle, so I couldn't play, but I still had to go to the games. And she said, why don't you write about the games? She was my English teacher. And so I began writing sports articles for, I think it was called the Wyckoff News, a local paper, mm -hmm published this high school kid writing about these soccer games. And I made them more romantic and dramatic and heroic than they were. And then she started having me write for the school paper. And then I took a creative writing class she had. And I wrote my first novel, I think my sophomore year in high school, which was a, um, you know, my version of a Kurt Vonnegut novel. And it was called Keep Out of the Reach of Children. Uh, and I think it was called that, or it was called, and, or the subtitle was, or Pesticide 7, because this was a pesticide they were spraying around here. And I even had... Gypsy moths. Yeah. one of our big issues. Yeah, and I used to have, um, I had illustrations. I think I might even have that book somewhere in a box. <laughs> so anyway, it, it began for me my sophomore year in high school. And then from Vonnegut, I read Hunter Thompson, because I, I eventually became <clears throat> the editor of the school paper. Then I read Jack Kerouac, and he was so romantic figure and i'm like i want to be a writer it's romantic before that i'd wanted to be a professional tennis player but i i guess i quickly realized my talents as a tennis player weren't going to go that far like the and david I'll, foster wallace thing where you're pretty good until the talent gaps i really guess yeah i i haven't read foster wallace on tennis that much i my thing was i made my high school tennis team but then I got so mentally destroyed by the fact that I was expected to shower with my teammates because <laughs> we would practice call. early in the morning before school because it was still winter at this indoor racket club where I later worked as the kid cleaning the courts before school around like 530 in the morning. But uh, I hadn't started puberty yet. And so I couldn't shower with the boys. It was became a huge psychological trauma for me. So I never went back out for the team because I, I, for years I was afraid to shower even after I'd started puberty. So <laughs> tennis got destroyed by my lack of puberty, oddly. So, and I probably didn't have the skill level like David yeah. Foster Wallace has gone too, that right? far. Yeah. But, uh, but this is an easier out th this way. you know. Yeah, I blame it on the lack of pubic hair than uh, talent. Um, so, yeah, so I switched from fantasies of being you know, Bjorn Borg. I also, I had modified it. I went from thinking Bjorn Borg to, I just wanted to be a tennis pro in a small town. I thought that was a romantic existence because the tennis pro in our town at the indoor club, not my town, the town next door, Franklin Lakes, he was cool and he drove like a two-seater car. And I thought that'd be a great life, just give tennis lessons all day. And it seemed like a lot of the women loved him, you know, take lessons from him. So, but... Uh, anyway, that I've, the long-winded answer, I wanted to become a writer by, by the time, by the end of my sophomore year in high school. The confessional aspect, you alluded, no, you didn't allude to, you threw it out there before. Mm. Um, and I'm sure you've gone through mm. therapy sessions to right, discuss right, this, but right. where did it begin for you? And was there a degree of, holy shit, I really shouldn't be saying X, Y, or Z, but once you put it out there, everything is out there. How did the confessional thing start? for you, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't really work in that vein too much anymore. Um, but, but that was where your early career kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, well, certainly my first novel was quite somewhat audaciously autobiographical yet fictionalized. Or, I mean, there were things in there that were very dark and strange that people would imagine could only have happened to me. And a lot of it did. And so there was a confessional aspect to that first book. And I, I remember at the time, wanting to shock people. And I think there was a need to confess. I mean, mm. I think it was Freud said, all of writing is confession. And without being aware of it, I was probably trying to understand who I was through my writing. Mm. Um, then later, at some point, when I was struggling to write a second novel, 
I discovered that when I spoke, people laughed. I, I had gone to some... Uh, Did it take I, you that long to figure out the performing Jew from New Jersey thing? Well, <laughs> I was a, I would perform here and there or be in things, and people always got a kick out of it. But I, I, it began to occur to me that something more was happening, that when I spoke, people really laughed. And I would, went to some AA meetings in the mid-'80s, and I would be talking about my life, and people would be in hysterics. I'm like, this is serious <laughs> stuff. Why, why are you laughing? And then I was at an artist colony in 1990, again, trying to write my second book, but couldn't. And at night, um, people would give readings, and I had nothing to read. But I, and I had discovered at dinner, again, at the McDowell colony, most everyone was older than me. I think it was like 25, 26. Most of the artists were in their 30s or 40s or 50s, 60s. That again, people were laughing. So I decided to, since I had nothing to read, that I would do a night of storytelling. And that was 1990. And so that began, and you know, two decades worth of being like a performer, kind of a yeah. Spalding Gray. And there was an element to having to talk about myself. And it was cathartic, I guess. But I also, I always wanted to entertain. And this was my way of entertaining people and giving them something. They felt less alone with their foibles or neuroses or insecurities. Now, at the same time, it was a little bit of a shell game because I might talk about things that seemed really outrageous to other people, but in some ways I was hiding, for me, yeah. greater secrets. From the storytelling, that led to getting a column in the New York press in the late 90s, and I can, kind of continued in that vein. Now, th again, this was pre-internet, though, and so these were disposable newspapers that would come out every two weeks. Everyone in New York was reading these two downtown papers, New York Press, Village Voice, and I knew that the paper would disappear in a week. Right. So I could take these risks, and I kind of wanted to be like Bukowski, and I was using myself as a character and exaggerating. Eventually, I collected all those columns and a number of books, at least four essay books. But by the after doing this kind of writing for a decade or more, I had begun to repeat myself. It, it sort of become shtick. It's the columnist curse in general. Yeah, and and it wasn't really authentic anymore. And it was almost... It had never been complete honesty because there was exaggeration and uh, and making yourself a character, you know, that there was a craft to it. I used to say there's a lot of fiction in the nonfiction. Now, I didn't make things up like some of these journalists, you know, writing yeah. at the time, the late 90s for the New Republic. or yeah, the Steaming Glass. Yeah, like this that. kind of stuff. Yeah. But I also wasn't doing the sort of reporting that they were doing. It was more in my life. And it was all based on real events. But... Anyway, but at some point, I, I just sort of stopped doing all that writing. And so it's not really a question I have to deal with now. Now, I did recently write for the first time in a long time a first-person essay, which you said you... Yeah, the uh, LA Review of Books. Yeah, 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 and it's about my dog uh, called Yet Another Love That Dare Not Speak Its Name. <laughs> and, but again, I wasn't going too far, you, you know, with revealing things that are going on in my mind. I, I find that the fiction, I, I prefer now to hide things. That's what I wondered when yeah. that, and, and you mentioned doing that from your first novel onwards, mm -hmm. but that sense of subsuming, watching mm -hmm. both of your, your TV shows, realizing that just the little elements and lines mm -hmm. that are just distributed mm -hmm. among characters and, and right. are, are thrown away, that, that sense of, again, subsuming your own life material into into fiction. Yeah, I think, you know, I began, the, my TV career kind of began in, well, we filmed the pilot for Bored to Death in 2008. And, and then basically from 2008 to 2016, I, you know, produced and wrote five seasons of television and didn't really have time for nonfiction or fiction anymore. Uh, in the middle between Bored to Death and my TV show Blunt Talk is when I briefly wrote this novella. Yeah. But yeah, so I began to enjoy hiding myself in these multiple characters. Now, oddly enough, with Bored to Death, the character was named Jonathan Ames. And that show arose out of a long, short story I wrote. And that kind of came out of the fact, speaking to your question, was that because when I would write all this nonfiction, people would say, oh, that didn't really happen. You, you made that up. And I'd be like, no, it's true. You know, maybe I 
made my retort or a little bit of the dialogue funnier than it was in real yeah. life or something like that. It was that. but yeah. But yeah. it was, they were true. But And then with my novels, like Wake Up, Sir, or The Extra Man, people were like, oh, why didn't you call that a memoir? And I'm like, well, it, there's, you know, all the events are made up and I'm not exactly like those narrators. And no, it's fiction. So it was like I couldn't win. You know, the nonfiction they were calling fiction, the fiction they were calling nonfiction. So I decided to write a piece of fiction, a, a long, short story called Bored to Death, n narrated by Jonathan Ames in the style of my essays, but completely fabricated thing where I, Jonathan Ames, put an ad on Craigslist, become a private detective. And so that became the show and then once it became a show, it, you know, it was actually the Ted Danson character played by George Christopher, who I may have spoken through a bit more directly because the Jonathan character in the show was younger than myself. Speaking of this whole autobiography thing, and you have one of my first collection of essays, it's called What's Not to Love? The Adventures of a Mildly Perverted Young Writer. And I called it that because, and I've mentioned this before, Dave Eggers had come out with a heartbreaking work of staggering yeah. genius. I'm like, well, I need something like that. So I'm like, The Adventures of a Mildly Perverted Young Writer. That's like kind of like a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. <laughs> no, it's not. Because for the next decade or more, and to this day, I'm still called perverted. Right. And people still ask, like, you write about yourself in such a revealing way. I'm like, well, actually, I don't. I haven't done it in like 10 or 12 years. But... So the word perverted got attached to my name for years. And then with the TV show, though, what was funny is people began to refer to me as the real Jonathan Ames because there now was like <laughs> a very version. vivid fictional Jonathan Ames running around on HBO. Hmm. Um, so I don't know what the where the question began, but... But the th stories are what counts. <laughs> yeah, so but it, it's all about drawing upon oneself to create either a nonfiction character or fiction character. And yeah, and now I'm really enjoying being an omniscient narrator, like in You Were Never Really Here and in, in its continuation, though there's a bit of me, in, quite a bit of me in Joe, you know, uh, in, in this new book. And so it's, there's, a, you know, uh, and but I also draw upon other people, like, like a, a photographer or a portrait artist. You know, I do draw upon other people for other characters, but I, I use a lot of my, what goes on in my mind and in my heart for a lot of these people. Like Blunt Talk, I was kind of speaking through all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I was just watching a few of them again mm -hmm. um, a couple nights ago on a flight home and, mm -hmm. and had the the echoes of some of the things I'd read in your work. But, mm -hmm. and again, maybe this is just a mm -hmm. bias on my part, a weird sense that it was somehow... Um, more mature than mm -hmm. bored to death, maybe mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. it was distanced from mm -hmm. Brooklyn. It, it mm -hmm. was in its own milieu. Mm -hmm. There were female characters mm -hmm. who were standalone. Um, I don't know how you feel about either of the shows. Uh, I'm sure they're both your babies, but you know, was there a sense of learning on the job with bored to death and expanding in into blunt talk or are they really divorced experiences? Uh, from no, each other? no, I think that's quite accurate. You know, I, I had never written for TV before, obviously. And so like, I, re I had to learn quickly on my feet on board to death. And, and, and it, it was an amazing experience. And, but then blunt talk was like a chance. I was happy to get a chance to do it again. And I took things I had learned about script writing and characters. And I do feel, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, it's hard for me to say, oh, which show is better yeah, or that kind of thing. That position, but so. um, I do think there was like, as you said, more characters in Blunt Talk. You know, um, Bored to Death was sort of, was focused on the three men, you know, and then there was um, women characters. But, you know, mostly the relationships they were having and 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 they were, I hope, strong women characters. But here in Blunt Talk, you know, they, the the women characters were equal to the male characters. I mean, Patrick Stewart was the lead, but they all were as vitally important. And it was like a large family. And maybe some of the themes or the writing or the issues. Um, I, I was very proud of um, what we did at Blunt Talk. I wrote like 600 pages of scripts in two years. And I, I wish the show had been seen more. Um, it and, killed me when they, they canceled it. I was uh, just, oh, this is, the, my wife and I was like, this is the show that we, you know. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, 
a lot of people didn't have the Stars Network. I don't even know where it's available now. I, may, I, I had to get the DVDs from Netflix and rip them and put them on my iPad because huh. they're not streaming unless you yeah. buy them um, from iTunes. I was like, yeah. really? It's and not both the DVDs? Yeah, I don't, the first I've, season. I haven't seen the second yeah, season. Yeah, I don't even think the second season's on a DVD. I mean, it's just been yeah. somehow this has to be rectified, though I'm not sure that I can. And but We'll start a campaign. Yeah. No, please yeah, do. Stuff to do. Please yeah. do. <laughs> um, I'd love for that to be back out in the world in some way. Um, but maybe, hopefully, it'll find its way. But in terms of learning on the job, were you working with a writing room at all? Or was this pretty Yes, much... in both cases, I had a writer's room and wonderful writers. And and what was that like for you working in that? that you mentioned the collaborative aspect of things. How did that? Uh... Well, at, at first in Bored to Death, it was difficult for me because I'd always been a novelist working on my own or writing my essays, working with one editor. Um, but I got the hang of it. And I mean, my writers know that uh, and I didn't feel good about it, but I would do a lot of rewriting um, because I've, my dialogue was very specific and somewhat idiosyncratic. Um, and, but the writers were very helpful with the plotting, figuring things out, uh, punching up the humor as it's called, um, and, and just figuring everything out with me. And, uh, so I had great, uh, supportive writing rooms on, uh, both shows mm -hmm. and, um, and came to really enjoy the process and really need the writers, um, and it's interesting how you go about creating a, a season of television. I, I won't go into it all here, but um, but yeah, it was it was. Uh, I came to you know really benefit from having a crew of people around me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had wondered, given how solitary the writing life is, mm -hmm. the prose writing life is, mm -hmm. what it was like for you having to step into a room where mm -hmm. my name is going on this, but mm -hmm. you know we're all mm -hmm. in this together. Uh, yeah, well, their names would go on the scripts as well, and uh, and they, you know, we would have very enjoyable writing rooms. The the writing still occurs by itself. You know, you're still alone writing the scripts, but the planning, the plotting out, um, and I would basically stand in front of a grease board, and it sort of determined that the you know a thirty page television script has about eighteen scenes, maybe between fifteen and twenty scenes. And so we would outline it. And once I hit 18 or 15 scenes, I'm like, okay, this I'll is the story. Out. And then now we've got to make sure it all works. And then from the outline, you write the scripts. Mm -hmm. um, so I would do that in front of the room and be like, okay, wait, we need to, uh, Patrick Stewart, we need to see him talking about this. Where should we put him? You know what I mean? And yeah, we assembling would, it like yeah. a, a puzzle. Of yeah. yeah. And, and that was really fun to do that together. Now, I do want to ask, I've, I've recorded with a bunch of Princeton alums, some of whom mm. overlap with you, one of whom saw that I was going to be recording with you, mm. uh, Gordon Van Gelder, mm -hmm. uh, science fiction publisher and editor who mm. says, um, can you ask him what he meant when he said he prematurely ejaculated his first novel? I've sort of been wondering about that for a while. <laughs> so, uh, Gordon's question number one, basically... Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know when I said that, but it sounded like I said that somewhere. Yeah. Or it sounds like I, I something I may the, have said. The, the, the first collection. Oh, too. see, I, I don't. One thing you asked, like, about the TV shows, and I, with the TV shows and the books, you almost don't even remember what's in them. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Oh, people call me out on things I say on this, on, yeah. on the podcast. I'm like, you understand, I don't remember from the time I post it. I'm on to the, I don't recall saying anything in the intro. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's the yeah. same with my books. I don't really yeah. know what's in there or when I said what, or <laughs> you just, you sort of move on. It's like a, it's like a diary entry or a letter. You, you yeah. turn the page literally. But I guess what I meant by that is as a joke was that my first novel was my senior thesis at Princeton. Mm -hmm. Um, and which I expanded to publish as a proper length novel. That was a very short first book. And so I, you know, and it came out by the time I was 25, but because it took me a while to expand it, it could have come out when I, I mean, I sold it when I was 23, right after I graduated from Princeton. So it could have conceivably come out, you know, before I was 24, but it took me a while to expand it. I got suddenly panicked and frightened and, uh, and then 
took it took longer. But so I think in that sense, and I and I didn't even fully know what I was doing. Not that anybody does. I hadn't put in my ten thousand hours yet, and so that's why I think it took me so long to write a second book. Was because the first book came out of this early love of literature and writing and and uh but i i needed to do more reading and more failing before i could write a second book so i guess in that sense i felt like whoa this just that one sort of just came out unexpectedly <laughs> like you know i was so excited about books i guess which is what over excitement causes not to horrify the listener premature ejaculation and insecurity and all sorts of mental issues you know too can cause that um i guess but uh, so I, I think that's what i meant <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. to answer my uh, fellow princetonians question well his other question revolved around the experience of princeton and studying under joyce carol oates mm-hmm. um his contention was that the undergrad program at Princeton was essentially as good as an MFA program mm-hmm. in creative writing. And he mm-hmm. was wondering if you felt that way, knowing that you did go on to, to do an MFA, mm-hmm. I guess, for a qualification for teaching. Mm-hmm. What did you get out of that that Princeton writing experience? Um, you know, I <clears> – <throat> everything. I um, – you know how you can sort of uh, – the visualization – I think when I got into Princeton, my mother told me, again, here's my mother, there's a famous writer there named Joyce Carol Oates. Maybe you'll be able to work with her. And I think I heard that you could write a creative thesis, like you could write a novel. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And then I think I even thought, like, I'll write my first novel at Princeton. And and then that ended up coming true. Um, and so I, I didn't get into the workshop the first semester freshman year, I, I was, uh, you know, it was like you had to apply. And I, I submitted, I guess, a couple of the pieces I'd written for my school newspaper. I had written some silly kind of comedic columns back then. Um, and I titled everything Fear and Loathing. Though I think I wrote Fear and Loathing at the video arcade. Like I was totally <laughs> stealing from Hunter Thompson. Yeah. And I wrote about, you know, losing my mind, you know, waiting for my co- college rejection or acceptance letters. I would write these sort of satirical pieces. But I got in second semester freshman year and uh, I got Joyce as my uh, workshop teacher. And she loved my first story that I wrote. And there was a a very uh, strong writer in that first workshop who has gone on to be a published novelist, Pinckney Benedict. And, And Joyce kind of just sort of took me under her wing and encouraged me. And that's the main thing I learned from a writing teacher was to encourage. And I taught writing, you know, for, I don't know, 20 or more years. And I just always, it was not my place to discourage anyone. Mm -hmm. Even if I didn't think they had the talent ultimately to become published, they're still making art, which was still a good way to spend time on the planet. So I always would encourage. And yeah, I think, you know, the level of teachers at Princeton in the creative writing program was so strong. My 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 thesis was read by Paul Auster. Now I never interacted with him, but he gave me an A minus, and <laughs> and what he wrote about my you know first my thesis, which became my first novel, I passed like night. Though I think the original title was I pity I because I felt that the character was very self pitying, but I, I spelled it E Y E P I T Y E Y E so that the words kind of looked like a face. I felt like the two yeah. the two words I looked like eyes and the word pity with the Y dropping down looked like a <laughs> nose. This was my twenty two year old mind. Um so I was exposed to great people there and it, it changed the course of my life to to have had such good teachers and to but to, to be encouraged and to be given the time to write, that I could write a novel as my thesis. And then later, uh, the book came out in 1989, but very quickly, and I didn't hardly got any money for that book, I was ended up living back in Princeton for a variety of odd reasons, but had no money and drove a taxi for two years and had no time to write and was struggling to support myself because as I was already a novelist at 25, who was going to hire me, you know? And I tried to get a job at the Princeton Library, but I don't think I typed quickly enough. I had to take a typing test. So anyway, a friend of mine said, 
why don't you go back to school? As long as you're in school, you're not failing. And so looking at it. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I, I wanted to get a teaching job and I wasn't getting any, no one was, uh, even interviewing me for teaching jobs, you know? And so, and I think I, the word was you need a master's. So I ended up going to Columbia to get my master's and that turned out to be really helpful going there. Cause again, I encountered wonderful teachers and had the time to write and, and as a young writer, I think being in workshops can help because it, you get things done mm-hmm. and you have to submit them. That's the main thing. Now, not every writer needs su- su- these, these structures. Um, I may have needed them and it, it forced me to get things into a somewhat polished state so I could uh, submit them to a workshop. And then, like I said, wonderful teachers at, also at Columbia took me under their wing and encouraged me. Mm-hmm. Now, who besides the the detective fiction, hmm. other influences literarily? I mean, you had you, you cite Hemingway, Fitzgerald, et cetera, some of the hmm. 20th century classics from hmm. that early phase in your hmm. career. Hmm. Who were you reading that uh, helped shape who you were as a writer? And Wodehouse, of course. Yeah. Um, well, early on, uh, I mean, for the first novel, it was definitely there was a a Hemingway influence of, of trying to write with clarity, simplicity, and even the way I structured the first novel where I would intersperse the chapters with italicized chapters, which is, I think what he may have done with um, men without women in his, or either his first or second book, which was kind of like linked short stories. Mm -hmm. And then also Jersey Kaczynski had done that with his book steps and then also Raymond Carver was very much in vogue back then. And, but, you know, he was kind of on the Hemingway branch of clean sentences. And then uh, Hubert Selby, though, for that first book, um, Last Exit to Brooklyn. Joyce Carol Oates actually told me to read that as, she be, as I began to submit chapters of the book. And then my second book was very much influenced by, like, Somerset Maugham, Thomas Mann, because I wanted, I loved the novels of young gentlemen, and and also um i also had started i had, i spent a year reading the first two the the two books of don quixote which very much influenced my desire to write comedy you know cervantes and then after that after the first two books it was years of writing columns and and bukowski was very much an influence cuz he had written a column for you know um Los Angeles, a free alternative paper in Los Angeles. And so, and I was writing a column, 1500 words, people were reading on the subway. And, and like I said, back then there was a freedom to taking risks. It wasn't like the internet, something up there forever. And yeah. I didn't think my parents would read the columns cause they didn't come into <laughs> New York. Um, and, you know, and I think I even wrote some nonfiction pieces in the style of Paul Auster. I, I loved some of his essays and then my novel Wake Up, Sir, was obviously very influenced by P.G. Woodhouse with a little bit of Cervantes. And then after that, uh, it was, you know, getting into TV, mm-hmm. and which then became its own thing. Uh, and I didn't really have too many television influences because I hadn't watched a lot of TV, but I was more drawing upon films for my references there, visually, um, comedy and now i'm just very influenced by pulp writers you know again richard stark a big influence for you were never really here was also david goodis um he's got a a collection of shorter pieces called black friday and there was always a great um uh compelling quality to those shorter pieces and to some of his novels so he was an influence there yeah, I have to say it was, um, I guess, New Year's of last year, I picked up The Friends of Eddie Coyle for the first time by George mm-hmm. V. Higgins and mm-hmm. went through that page turner mode that you're talking about. It's 170 pages. I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm just going to keep reading this mm-hmm. until I stop because mm-hmm. this thing just completely mm-hmm. electrifies me. So, yeah, there is something about that particular type of writing that uh, well, is a charge, I guess. Mm-hmm. To throw another line from your your past at you, but not mm-hmm. in a bad way. Mm-hmm. Um 
you once mentioned most of my youthful travels were inspired by literature mm -hmm. and you cited a couple of mm -hmm. trips, Isherwood, mm -hmm. Berlin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, literary pilgrim. Do you still do anything like that? Going to certain places because of certain writers or is that really slowed down in your, your busier days? Yeah. You know, um, I, I remember, I guess I sort of remember writing that and I, I, I wrote an introduction to, uh, George Plimpton's the curious case of Sid Finch. And, uh, I was glancing at it, it because I gave that book to, um, my nephew who's a huge baseball fan and I, and I didn't have time to read my whole introduction, but yeah, back th there was a time in my life where I, I went to a bar in Havana because Hemingway had been there. And I think George Plimpton in one of his books had written about meeting Hemingway at that bar. And then I went to Hemingway's house. I don't think my um, travels are as inspired by seeking out where writers had been. You know, in my youth, definitely, you know, Paris, again, Hemingway or Fitzgerald. Uh, I, I once drove someone's VW van cross country because to Denver because... Kerouac and on the road was always trying to get to Denver. Um, so I'm not that way. And now I seem to always, my travel has more to do with business, which gives me great opportunity. Like I went to the London Film Festival for the movie, but again, I'm, I wasn't thinking so much of literature. Yeah, did you uh, get out and do any sort of literary sightseeing on that trip? Well, or you... not really, but I think I, I was thinking of Graham Greene and Anthony Pohl. And when I was walking through the West Village the other day, I, I was thinking of Don Powell, who would write so much about the West Village. It was kind of fun to be there. And I recently reread uh, for another podcast, I had to choose a, a book to talk about or my favorite book, which, and it wasn't necessarily my favorite book, but just came to mind because I did another podcast where I had to choose my favorite movies and said, Jeez. I just, I'm much more open-ended. with Yeah. This stuff, so, but, but I, in both cases, I just cho chose a book and a movie that I love, but I thought, Oh, I'll do the same one, which is fat city by Leonard Gardner, yeah. which is a brilliant book and a brilliant film. John and, Houston, right? Yeah. And, and I rewatched the film recently, reread the book and I thought, you know, what? I'd like to go to Stockton, California, where this is all set. You know, it's so yeah. evocative the way he writes of, the way he writes about it, and the way then Houston filmed it. Now I'm sure it's completely different, but that's maybe a case of wanting to do some yeah. literary oriented travel. But yeah, I used to do a lot of it. Went up to Big Sur, went to uh, yeah, Henry that my, Miller's. That was my big one. I, I yeah. did a Pacific Coast trip once. I stopped. Big Sur for the Henry Miller thing, <coughs> uh, all the way down to Oxnard, so I could see mm. where the Hernandez brothers mm -hmm. grew up, the guys who do mm. the Love and Rockets comic, which is mm. one of the great comic mm. books of all mm. time. And then Venice Beach, where Ted Hawkins used to play out on the, mm. the, the street, because mm. uh, we have nothing in common. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that was my my one little, well, let me just mm. see if I could do the entire West Coast mm. as, as one of those trips. So. Yeah. yeah, I once drove from L.A. to Portland on my own little book tour, actually, that I financed back in 2002. and But I had also, uh, yeah, but earlier I think I had done that trip also back in the 90s. And uh, Were you but, a big Henry Miller guy? And not that point? big. I think I... I only, I think I've only read, and this would be like 30 years ago, uh, Tropic of Cancer. Mm -hmm. I think when I would try his other books, they weren't as accessible, but yeah. I remember Tropic of Cancer really enjoying, but I think I read it when I was like 22, so like that's, that's 32 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, stupidest, I have some money now. Mm. Now that I'm in, in Hollywood, mm -hmm. purchase or decision mm. you've, you've made, like, not that we're going to say you hit it big, but, you mm. know, you're more successful now. Mm. Did you do something stupid with money at, at one point? Um, I don't, I don't think I've done anything stupid. I, I've lived, you know, I was broke until about 44 and now the last 10 years working TV. Now I'm having to tighten my belt again, though, because I, I haven't been in TV for about a year and... Um, but at some point, well, when I was really broke, I read in the New York post, a description of the book, the secret. And I saw one line from it and it said, if you act like you're rich, you'll be rich. And I started doing that 
like in 2006 or seven, before money came in, I, I stopped being cheap with myself. I used to just like use the same toothbrush. It was basically probably like rubbing, you know, a stick, a s- yeah. typhus <laughs> in my mouth or, you know, a staph infection. Basically, it was like it wasn't brushing my teeth. I was spreading staph infection. And I would wear underwear that had holes, you you know, and I stopped being cheap with myself. And then I, and then I also became the kind of person, but I went out with friends, oh, I'll get dinner, even if it was like, I'm like, or I'll, I'll pick up a drink. I just stopped being cheap and, or being so frightened about money. And then it took a while, but then money started coming to me. And so, but I never lived in a fancy way. So I can't think of anything stupid I've done with money. I, I've given a lot of money away. Um, I, I, I sometimes I, I, I once stayed in a hotel for like 10 days or two weeks, kind of pretending. Cause in my mind it was like in the Fitzgerald short stories when people used to live in hotels, yeah. but I, I could afford it. It was during the bored to death years. And, and now I, I went to dinner recently at that hotel. I thought, Oh my God, I spent 10 days here. What was I thinking? I mean, that's <laughs> okay. I mean, so yeah, that's sort of what I was wondering if yeah, there were any of those. those yeah. Things. I think that would be about it though. And I, you know, I, I still don't have fancy clothes. I, I've kind of fantasized about buying a nice watch, but I haven't. Um, mostly I've, I, if buy. anything, I've probably given away, too much money you know I, is it in the bible neither a borrower nor lender be but even that i don't regret i think it's hamlet but whatever that's oh, okay that's, is yeah, it bible uh, or hamlet <laughs> um oh god i'm blanking on the character hmm. now but yeah he's, he's the one who, who gives all the advice to his son and then hmm. gets killed so yeah i'm i'm i think there's been more wasteful stupid things like not knowing that uh you know, I think I wasn't living in New York for two years, but still had my apartment. But I was like still paying for a phone or cable yeah. or something like, oh, no, you idiot. <laughs> but you weren't so. buying first editions of, of Richard Starks or anything N- that was going to, you know. N- no, okay. nothing over the top like that. I feel bad. I wish I had something really stupid I had done. I, oh, you want to hear something stupid? Yeah, Money wise. Um, I went down. To, I spent like six weeks. It was a beautiful, beautiful trip. Uh on the uh, Sea of Cortez, uh, in a house on a cliff, very inexpensive, solar-paneled house, though, you know, off of dirt roads. It was yeah. about 50 miles from civilization. It was great, though, and there was all these expatriates, pristine beaches, desert. It was one of the most beautiful times of my life. And But I had to rent a Jeep, and I was with my girlfriend at the time, and I don't think I fully understood what was happening when I rented the Jeep. So when I returned it and I extended the trip six weeks, when I returned the Jeep, it for six weeks, I think it cost me almost nine or ten thousand dollars. The cost of the Jeep. And I'm like, oh, my God, I could have bought a Jeep. And it was so much more expensive than the house itself, which was like something really maybe like only three thousand dollars. I know that sounds like a lot for six weeks, but it was literally on a cliff, three houses on like a five mile stretch of beach. And, and, you know, we would just stock up on food and then drive 50 miles once a week. We'd drive into the town about 50 miles away. And the car, the rental car, that That's sort of killed me. <laughs> See, that, that's something. At least it's okay. a, the, the, the lack of knowledge of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so on your IMDb page, mm-hmm. I noticed, you, well, apparently you were in Moonlighting, the show, um, for a little bit. That is untrue. Uh, okay. There's someone named Jonathan Ames who was on Moonlighting. That's what was puzzling me because it's years but, it wouldn't have made sense. So yeah. IMDb, you know, unless you have IMDb Pro, which I don't have, isn't always necessarily correct. Yeah. And and I think some of my IMDb credits have gone to this other Ames. actor who I don't even know, know who he is. But yeah, I wasn't on Moonlighting. I haven't looked at my IMDb page for a while. I think at one point I tried to... Have someone say, like, I'm not the guy who was on yeah. Moonlighting. Or don't put my writing credits under, the because it would be like Moonlighting and Bored to Death. or Like, yeah. it's so confusing. And then I realized there was a mistake on my Wikipedia page, which just today I asked someone to change, because it lists You Were Never Really Here as a short story. And now I'm starting to see reviews of the movie come out saying, based, based on, on the short story. I'm like, oh, no, because it's based on the novel or novella. It, and it's supposed to say based on the book by. Because yeah. if people see based on the short story, they're not going to 
Try to find the original book Although to read. IMDb also has uh, Joaquin Phoenix as a co-author of the book. So that that's something to watch out for. Wow. Too. Well, the, the Moonlighting <laughs> thing just gets weirder because in Bored to Death, you had Elise Beasley play the mother of Jonathan Ames. Uh, or at least she was cast as the, the mother of yeah, Jonathan yeah, Ames. So, yeah, yeah I, I was – my brain melted down at that point. Wait, did he get her? Why, why oh, I'm he so have... sad that your brain melted down over <laughs> something based in like – you know what I mean? But that's that's the nature of life though, a misunderstanding. Right. <laughs> you 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 – like at least five minutes of your precious life were flummoxed by it, like a mistake wife, like, on Wikipedia. Thing, but he apparently he was on Moonlighting. Oh, it would have been a Princeton. Annalise Beasley was on the show. Maybe there's some sort of weird tie in I'm not thinking of. <laughs> so yeah, it's nice when conspiracies completely fall apart. In the right, face exactly. Just imagine, yeah, the conspiracies that could fall apart <laughs> that are much larger. Now the bigger question I have that I, I I would have assumed was the case when I first started, you know, reading your work, a sense of imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. or do you have a mm-hmm. sense that you've actually earned, you know, where you are and what you've achieved? Well, yeah, I don't know if it's so much imposter syndrome. I mean, we all struggle with who, who we are yeah. and, and we don't really have a sense of ourselves or, or necessarily what we've achieved. Like, I mean, when I finish my books, um, like I said, I don't remember what I've written. Mm-hmm. And and every now and then, like, I try to look at them all, like, I've done all that? When did I do all that? When did I sit down? And I don't know about earning, you know, I, I think one of the things, like, with this book coming out in the movie, it's it's finding this balance with one's ego. And I think for a long time I did have a chip on my shoulder as a writer because I struggled so much. I'm like, why can't I pay the rent better? Or why didn't I get a review here? You know, and this kind of stuff, unfortunately, can cause you to suffer. And, and at the same time with a career, you need to assert yourself and put yourself out there. And I don't know, it's an it's interesting balancing act. What I've been thinking lately, and or, or have always thought, is really the pleasure in in any life or in, in in the artist's life, and this can apply to other lives, is doing the work itself. It's mm-hmm. not what people perceive of you and your career or going to the opening of the film or, you know, being at a bookstore and giving a reading can be really fun, of course, because you meet people and, 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 you know, I've always had the goal. I'm going to entertain people. I'm going to give them something. And then you meet the people that enjoy what you've given them. Though it can feel a little awkward or strange, but really the pleasure is in the work and and these things of what your place is or what you've achieved, it's it's kind of insubstantial. It's, it's not, it's, I don't know, it's like smoke, you know, and it's all, once you're gone, it's even more like smoke, of course. So, I mean, you said it earlier, you don't remember the podcast you did, you just move on to the next one. So, um so it's it's the work is really the joy. Like when I mean, it takes me forever to sit down, and I'm frightened to sit down and write, and I go through all sorts of tribulations. But then once I'm sitting down, and even then it can be a struggle. That is the fun time. That's like being the gardener who's you know digging into his earth in the back of his house. Um, but I'm also every now and then I'm able to step back and be pleased in that. My first book came out in 1989. It's now 2018. So I've had a 29-year a career in the arts. I might not have ever envisioned that for myself. You know, I probably thought at one point, oh, I guess I should be a lawyer or I was a taxi driver or I was going to, you know, I was like, wow, I've had a 29-year career in the arts. That's pretty good. Now, of course, there's the fear, can you keep it going, you know, and keep supporting oneself or keep making art? But I, I don't you know, I hope so. So anyway, it's a long winded thing of earning ones. I I don't know that I felt like an imposter. I know a little bit with this movie, because you're as the author, you're a little bit on the outside. It's kind of like I'm throwing a party, but I'm not necessarily invited. (laughs) It's like, there is no movie without me. But at the same time, they don't really need me at this point. So part of me is like, wait, I I wrote the book or, you know, and it did start with me. Yeah. And kind of the character that Joaquin's playing, it sort of reflects my inner life at a certain time. And anyway, but it, it's all 
it's all an interesting adventure. And, and I don't know, I, I've been reading a lot of Buddhist texts and we're just meant to learn from everything. And, um, so this is a long, I don't know what I deserve or I don't deserve, but I think I, I can acknowledge or pat myself on the back a little bit like, Hey, you've been making work for 29 years and really all sorts of different kinds of things, you know? And, and I never, I never, someone had told me early on that my grammar wasn't very good and it wasn't. And so part of me has felt like I'm not the most natural writer or, or have quite the intelligence for fully understanding the sentence mathematically, though I have my own crude understanding of it. So part of me has always felt like I, I, would, I wasn't complete in a way. Um, and yet somehow I've persevered. But I don't know, being humble, humility, and just trying to help others is the main way to be alive and not thinking too much about what you've done or are doing. I don't know. I'm not really saying anything too interesting or making too much sense, but I'll <laughs> shut up now. <laughs> no worries. It's fine. I'll let you get back to touring northern New Jersey and kind of re actually I should ask, are you being triggered with any any weird memories of of childhood and and growing up in northern New Jersey having come out here? Or? Well, driving out here, it's so familiar to me. You you know, like I mean, I haven't really been out here in 4 years or so. Uh, when I helped my parents move out of my childhood home, where they had been since 1960. But uh, the road, the color of the trees, the sky, I, I know it like, I, I, I know my own face, which I don't necessarily know that well, but it, it's like I've never left, really. So I don't know necessarily that I'm triggered. There's some, maybe some sadness that, Maybe after this trip, I don't know if I'll ever come back through here again. Um, so, uh, but it, it's it's nice to return. And I'm going to go by my old childhood home now. I'm in touch with the people who live there. And uh, and I'm curious to see what they've done. And But there probably will be a sense of loss and death. Like, my parents aren't there anymore, though my parents are still alive. And I almost wanted to stop at the nursing home where my great aunt was for 10 years and where I, I ended up doing a deathbed vigil with her for six days. Like, I want to walk down that hallway and go to her room and that she'll still be there. But I know she won't be, so I won't go by the nursing home. So there is... There's sadness around here for me. I'll let you go. You should go to the top of Skyline Drive and look out over New York City again, 25 mm -hmm. miles away. It's still yeah. one of the joys of living here, as I put it. And, well, an amazing coincidence, and I know we have to wrap up, is that the lake near here is where they shot a scene of Joaquin Phoenix. Don't tell. You're spoiling it. I'm just kidding. Oh, oh God. Oh, well, but anyway, but it turned out it was this lake right here in Oakland you know, four miles from here on this same bit of road where you are that I used to go hiking at and swam in that lake with my dog. And so of all the locations in the New York metropolitan area that they should choose that lake, unbeknownst that it was my hometown. <laughs> I, I love coincidences like that. And you, you did ask, you said you were going to ask me what I've been reading lately, just to end on a less, uh, not a sad note, but I, I just want to put it out there. I get so much from the books of this writer, Pema Chodron. She's a, uh, a Buddhist nun, an American Buddhist nun, and she has books like uh, When Things Fall Apart, The Wisdom of No Escape, and I've just been learning so much from her books, and I've sort of been studying them now for like two or three years. And so that's sort of what I've been reading lately, plus Fat City, and uh, recently read a Robert Cray novel, uh, one of his, um, he's got a, a detective series, I forget the detective's last name, but first name is Elvis, and then he's got a wonderful book called uh, Suspect, about a, a Los Angeles uh policeman and his police dog so that's some of what i've been reading but thank you very much for having me you know i really enjoyed talking to you jonathan thanks for coming on thank you
And that was Jonathan Ames. His new book is the novella You Were Never Really Here, which comes out as a movie this week starring Joaquin Phoenix. As mentioned at the top, Jonathan's written a bunch of novels and collections of essays and nonfiction. Um, they're pretty uniformly worth reading. I, I really enjoy his prose. He's also the creator of Bored to Death and Blunt Talk, two TV shows which I absolutely loved. You can follow Jonathan on Twitter at Jonathan Ames, which is J O N A T H. A-N-A-M-E-S. You should also look up his recent essay at the L.A. Review of Books, which I am glad my dog did not read before he met Jonathan. Now, I want to thank Dean Haspiel, who's next week's guest, for connecting me and Jonathan. Uh, Dean drew the graphic novel The Alcoholic from Jonathan's script, and that's going to be getting a reissue later this year for its 10th anniversary. And you can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project that I'm beating myself up about, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, as noted, we recorded this episode at my home in Ringwood, New Jersey, so it didn't cost me a dime. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Noah Van Skyver, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Les Camella, Joe Caruso, Paul Karazik, and Michael Janicek for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with cartoonist, playwright, and Jonathan Ames' pal, Dean Haspiel. Till then, you can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes, again, on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at Facebook.com slash Virtual Memories Show, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. <laughs>